Factor A's are 1 and 2 by the combined efforts of Enix, long before they merged with Square, of course, hence Square Enix now, and Quintet, circa 1991 and 1993 respectively. If they're watching this, Magic Mike Naughton, Max Clark from Bitbar and Trident, and Phil Healy from Norcam and Boston Open Screen, this is for you three. <laughs> Oh, here's a personal fun fact. I remember discovering this via Nick Arcade during my childhood, for the record. Also, if they're watching this, to Chad Rude, Kim Tran, and Corey Valoy, this is for you three also. Those aside, the overall premise goes like this. A godlike being, the Master, aka God, once overthrown by Tantra, aka the Evil One, or Satan. Then again, Nintendo of America's usual anti-religion censorship policies and his six cronies retreated to a sky palace to tend to his wounds with the help of an angel, thereby falling into an eternal rest. Meanwhile, Tanzer managed to separate the world into six lands, Fillmore, Bloodpool, Cassandora, Aitos, Marana, and Northwall, and turning all of their existing human inhabitants to evil under his cronies. Following countless centuries, the Master suddenly resurrects himself despite his overall powers being lost due to lack of self-belief and faith, thanks to that very same angel, of course. And to top it all off, the Master intends to rebuild every separated and dark-influenced civilization in order to regain said powers and eventually annihilate the fucking shit out of that demonic douche and his six cock-knocking crony-ass comrades. Regarding the primary gameplay aspect, it's an action-slash-RPG platforming romp, and might I add, a range of a standard to extremely intense one at that, akin to the long-since defunct Broderbund, Imagineer and Infinity's Battle of Olympus, Legacy of the Wizard by Falcom, also reprogrammed by Quintet, <laughs> Titles Rastian and the like, crossed with Maxis' Sim City, Sim Earth, populous by the long-since defunct Bullfrog Care of EA, and to a much lesser degree, Sid Meier's Civilization by Microprose. We are taking control of both the Master, aka God, and his Angel. In the latter case, upon naming your character, you are introduced to the Sky Palace where the Angel lays down all the necessary deeds, and a command menu is summoned with four categories and two choices per category. To move, fight, status, and other. The first of which entails the Sky Palace movement, where you are free to relocate the Sky Palace's inner chambers whenever necessary, while viewing the world and its six civilizations, depending on their overall progresses from a top view perspective, while descending and or ascending upon any of said civilizations via X and A individually, and observe the people, where that earlier referenced environmental sim is involved, on which I'll particularize further ASAP, but for the time being, it's restricted until the first act is cleared. As for the second category, Fights, where it entails taking on monsters, the first of your two acts begins in Fillmore, likewise for every other civilization that involves two acts in terms of resurrecting the Master slash God in statue form to a full-fledged flesh-and-blood champion for the purpose of obliterating every adversary until approaching and annihilating their own area-specific boss, and select magic, where the Master aka God can use whatever magic incantation he desires in battle, via X and or A, depending on which of them are awarded during the simulation phases, Fire, Stardust, which I'm sure many are aware, is OP as all fucking get out, Aura, and Light, all of which cost a single point of magic, or MP if you will. As for the third category, Status, there will be two types you're free to access before or in between either the action and or simulation modes. Status of the Master, in which the following are displayed, his level, special powers, required for acts of nature in the simulation modes, his health and magic, aka HP and MP respectively, the required population numbers in order to advance to the next level, hence next, the overall population of the world's inhabitants from all the six civilizations combined, hence total, the aforementioned magic incantations he's accumulated, the items accumulated through the offerings you accept from the town's leaders, or shrine keepers if you will, and secondly, status of cities, in which all of the six civilization stats are shown in terms of their respective population numbers, hence the human icon, increasing speed, normal, or stopping, each of the six civilizations cultural levels, and the aforementioned total of offering items discovered, and lastly, other, entailing the progress log, where you can save and continue later, but take note that you have to reset each time before proceeding or taking a break, and changing the game's message speed, from zero being the fastest to nine being the slowest.
With these out of the way, the first act in Fillmore, as mentioned previously, and sues upon selecting fight monsters, hence where the game's overall backbone is involved in the form of the action slash RPG platforming segments. Control-wise, the D-pad lets the Master, aka God, venture forth to his heart's desire, retreat and duck wherever and whenever necessary, not to mention the Sky Palace when redirecting its placement above the world's continents and the Angel during simulation mode. Y lets him attack with a sword, B lets him jump, and about those earlier stated magic techniques, again executed via XRA, please refer to what I stated during the menu discussion. Regarding the different items that appear from the Light Orb Towers, in time of need, within these and other acts, both a whole and half apple replenish the Master's vitality in its entirety and by half individually. Crowns for 500 and 1000 bonus points, magic scrolls for extra MP, 8 of which the Master is allowed to possess in order to summon his incantations, and are lost instantly upon death. The Flame Sword projectile that deals double the damage of the Master's original sword, only available until the end of each act, except against Tandra at the end of Death Heim, a crushed statue for an instant screen nuke, in other words, it obliterates the ever-loving fuck out of all on-screen adversaries, and even the traditional one-ups. By now, it should be obvious what fucking purpose they serve, take way too much damage from every mutant, beast, and or other absolutely no pun intended whatsoever, otherworldly creature, or even worse still, wind up exposed to any common environmental hazard, expect an instantaneous one-way ticket to the afterlife for your ass. Upon reaching this particular area's first boss, namely the half Knight Centaur, armed with a lance that also summons lightning, by the way, you're best off taking cover near the wall where he can't reach until landing at least a crouching strike or two on that son of a bitch, or just flat out landing a standing strike or two before or after the lance's lightning appears. Wash, rinse, and repeat, and eventually the motherfucker's annihilated, thus closing the book on your first ever act. Send my fucking regards to Lucifer Cockstain! Following this, we're then greeted with the actual civilization of Fillmore itself, and the Angel's orders to protect every inhabitant, and their currently derelict, yet soon-to-be-developed town from the remaining demons, hence where the environmental simulation aspect is involved. Likewise for the other five civilizations in the world, the earlier announced Bloodpool, Cassandora, Itos, Morana, and Northwall. More often than not, there will be demands and wishes from the town leaders, hence the Shrine Keepers, in terms of which improvements to make on yours and the Angel's behalf. So take my rather willing advice, DON'T FUCKING IGNORE them. In the case of Fillmore, there's three pentagrams that constantly summon the invading beasts, hence the Monsters' Lairs, from which the Napper Bats, Blue Dragons, and in later civilizations, Red Demons, and those floating goddamn Golden Skulls materialize on a frequent basis, by which I mean all the fucking time, and they all have to be exterminated in order to prevent any hindrances in the town's expansion efforts. The Angel can fire off its arrows to wipe out these creatures as a means of building up his special powers, SP for short, and the Master's SP, via Y. And as for this mode's command window, summoned via B, it entails the following. To move, once again, the Sky Palace movement relocates the palace's position, just as when you're within. Or you can return to the Sky Palace, in other words, you'll wind up going back there for any further acts to participate in, or other necessary actions. Direct the people, which entails the following. Building direction, depending on the overall population, you're free to let the civilization's inhabitants develop their town through construction of houses, businesses, you name it, and or sealing the aforementioned monsters' lairs to prevent their dark-hearted asses from continuously emerging, and let us listen, hearing from the Shrine Keepers, and learning about their demands, difficulties, updates, what have us. Next is the Miracles menu, which lets you summon different acts of nature in order to further the inhabitants' construction and development efforts, all at the cost of a certain number of SP depending on the land's population numbers. Lightning for 10 SP destroys bushes, trees, houses, fields, and rocks. Rain at the cost of 20 SP extinguishes fires, restores dried-up fields to more productive types, quenches the thirst of any needy inhabitants, and even turns vast barren deserts into the most lush and productive grasslands. Sun, at the cost of 30 SP, dries up marsh-infested lands and melts snow, thereby re-inhabiting formerly Arctic Northlands. 
most notably Northwall, when at the cost of ADSP, blows away every flying monster in view, thereby forcing them out of the scene, until or after their respective layers are sealed. And finally, Earthquake, at the cost of a mind-blowing 160 SP, is nothing more than a double-edged sword, which not only also makes every monster their bottom bitch, but can also affect the continent you're making every effort to maintain and develop, thereby sabotaging all housing and fields in the process. Therefore, it would be wise to summon it at your own mother goddamn fucking risk. And while we're at it, the lakes, forests, and mountains are permanent and are unable to be obliterated or flushed out with the obvious exception of everything else. And then we come to the offerings. In case any of the inhabitants discover any curious item and or skill while developing their towns or permanently sealing every monster lair, they're presented as such and can be either accepted and or exploited, hence take an offering or use an offering respectively, at any point throughout the simulation sessions. These offerings include the sources of magic, which advances the master's MP, bridges, with which you can have your current civilization built between rivers and can thereby share this very same construction skill with the others. The bomb, which instantly annihilates all monsters, hence yet another screen nuke, and wheat, which helps to make every scarce field into more productive fields for the supply and nourishment of all the inhabitants. In terms of the other two options, status and other, please refer to what I discussed earlier as they're the same when you're in the Sky Palace's chambers. <laughs> The hourglass at the top center to the right indicates the passage of real time, not only during the simulation sessions, but also in the two RPG platforming acts of each continent and in the Sky Palace when the red sand drips from top to bottom. When any civilization is on the verge of being organized and built, hence the town under construction warning that pops up in the middle, the red sand is at the bottom. Over time, when all the monsters' lairs are permanently sealed and as many houses are fully built and solidified, thereby spiking up the town's overall population, the masters and angels' levels in HP will be raised, and expect the same shit to happen depending on the overall unyielding pillars of effort being applied in improving and evolving every continent. The more often their stats are advanced, the greater their chances become of eventually pursuing not only the second act of Fillmore, but each of the two acts in the remaining five continents until reaching Death Heim. With the exception of the simulation mode routines in each continent, every boss you confront in the two acts range from posing standard sufficient challenges, hence our usual next frame of reference, to downright overwhelming, sanity raping, and excessive beyond all recognition. Starting with Minotaurus in Act 2 of Fillmore, the yellow chimera-like fire-breathing flesh-eater Manticore, and Zeppelin Wolf, a pale red-haired wizard dressed in a blue robe with both a purple mantle and cloak that even transforms into a werewolf near death in Bloodpool, Acts 1 and 2, the giant gray red-eyed sand-barrowing and rock-spewing antlion Dagoba, and the massive Egyptian-inspired metallic death mask Pharaoh in Cassandora, Acts 1 and 2, the botanical man-eating parasitic plant Raflasher, and the six-armed cobra-like Hindu-inspired priest Kalia in Moran, Acts 1 and 2, the extensive dragon-like serpent, and the spiritual, cycloptic, tusk-faced firewheel in Acts 1 and 2 of Itos, the armored-winged demonic guardian Mermanfly, and the frost-blue scaled and icy-spiked arctic wyvern in Northwall, Acts 1 and 2, and lastly, that demonic dick-faced Tanzra, aka Satan, at the very end of Death Heim, after confronting each of the second act boss guardians from each continent, namely the aforementioned Minotaurus, all the way through Kalia, for the second goddamn time! I mean, seriously, if any think I'm spewing random and accurate horseshit out of my own ass, or just flat out fucked in the brain stems when it comes to the gravity of persevering in both the action scenes and the simulation sessions, think the shit fucking Christ again, cause the odds are each of them will make damn sure your chances of triumph are so far up the Loch Ness Monster's ass, it'll be ten times more goddamn difficult to crawl out of there, as opposed to surviving the former and enduring every threat that lies ahead before reaching all these bastard guardians. Likewise for the latter, in terms of what's been laid down thus far, about which I may consider particularizing more as long as the result turns out to be far from redundant. That being said, the controls, while slightly delayed and corrupted, mechanics-wise, are at the very least competent enough, no matter what phase you're enduring, and dependent of which strategies you're bound to rely on more often than not, and the gameplay facets for both modes are nothing short of exceptional and compliant to adapt to in more ways than one could possibly fabricate. Challenge-wise, as expected of any large-scale RPG-slash-action platformer, except with a simulation feature whisked right into the mix, in this game's case at least, Act Racer takes no fucking prisoners and shows no fucking remorse whatsoever. Therefore, I'd make every effort fathomable to fend for myself, and then some, regarding all the threats of the six corrupted civilizations, cause this game won't be there to kiss your ass very often, oh shit no!
With the exception of the first two acts of Fillmore, and maybe those of Bloodpool, the level designs for every other scene thereafter can get rather rugged at times, even before reaching every other Guardian, but at least there's both a decent abundance of items to aid the Master in his most desperate scenarios, not to mention the leveling system that's applied in the earlier described simulation phases, based predominantly on how much he and the Angel have been helping to restore all of the once tranquil yet ruined continents to their former glory, while permanently sealing all of the monsters' lairs to prevent any more recurring minion respawns, let alone any specific threats, in terms of humans being unexpectedly kidnapped by monsters, houses being destroyed by either the monsters, or on behalf of the inhabitants' own naivety, lack of resources, you name it, and or discover necessary key items or skills, which can turn out to be as daunting as cleaning one's own apartment and or house without any maids. But it's still mandatory if you're beyond willing to not only gain access to every next continent, but to mainly stand any chance whatsoever against the area's respective guardians, even, yet again, before pursuing and toppling Tandra once and for all. Considering the limitations of every act of nature you summon, and or the magic incantations you execute in both the simulation phases and the 12 platformer acts, 13 including the repeat confrontations against Minotaurus, Zeppelin Wolf, the Pharaoh, Firewheel, Kalia, and the Arctic Wyvern before Tandra and Deathheim, respectively, there are specific intervals in which they're also mandatory to ensure the fulfillment of the Master's sworn duties, which I more than suggest figuring out for myself if I were you. And don't waste too much SP and or MP, otherwise, and I cannot stress this the fucking Christ enough, consider yourself an extreme deep shit! Should you happen to lose your last life, you're taken back to the Sky Palace, where the Angel encourages you to once again make a long-awaited return after reflecting on your recent downfall. Hence why, psh, isn't it already self-fucking evident by this point? It's always important to save your progress often, and or in advance, amongst the library of other valuable survival hints many have administered for countless years upon years. Not just yours truly for fuck's sake, and while we're at it, never leave any stone unturned, in a metaphorical sense so to speak, when it comes to discovering those aforementioned crucial items, skills, and or extra magic scrolls for the incantations. There's even a professional campaign, the very same showcased on Nick Arcade, which can be accessed upon beating it once, featuring only the 13 platforming scenes minus any magical benefits whatsoever, so best of luck in case you happen to reach that plateau! Graphically, even for yet another early, first-year launch title, as many might expect, the time-honored aesthetics don't disappoint a single solitary iota whatsoever, as they employ every aspect of what the SNES's full capabilities are made of, including but not limited to its always-lauded Mode 7 feature, applied to both the opening title sequence and at the start of each act from within the Sky Palace, above each colony, as the view descends into either a ring or palace. In addition, all of the varying environmental settings for each civilization possess their undeniable assortments of vibrance and flair, despite other settings appearing to be as dismal as a failing bulb, specifically all the caverns, except maybe for Northwall. And let's not get ourselves started with the evolving municipalities during the simulation phases featuring the Angel, despite mostly being seen at Sky Palace, confronting every often respawning monster until the inhabitants permanently seal their underground burrows. Thanks to your pre-planned direction efforts, the miniaturized inhabitants dealing with one situation after another over time, given the console's limitations, that is, and the obvious as fuck differences in geography between all six of them. The Master by himself doesn't disappoint either when being resurrected upon commencing each platforming phase and transforms back to stone at the very end. The ongoing intense hardships and conflicts he sustains, nor do the effects of the four incantations he uses, and even the immeasurable armies of medieval and fantasy-inspired adversaries, which make even George, Lizzie, and Ralph from the Lunxus defunct Midway's Rampage look like the rodents of unusual size from The Princess Bride. The usual excessive gloating aside, every bracketed aspect should more than tie each other together like the dude's living room rug before it got pissed on by Wu from The Big Lebowski, even those known to be religion-inspired, which I'm guessing this game's trying to go for, once again given Nintendo's strict censorship policies, which I'm in no position to elaborate. Music and sound-wise, composed by the always immaculate and unmatched Yuzo Koshiro, to whose legacy we should all be more than accustomed by this point, for the record, the majority of every song leaves absolute jack-fucking shit to be desired whatsoever. In other words, they don't suck major ass at all! All the driving, gallant, and at times tranquil and amicable songs, specifically those in the 13 acts, despite some being recycled from others, are the epitome of admirable, as are the more ethereal, divine, and harmonious themes during the top few simulation phases, despite how long-winded and somber the latter describes plethora can be at times. The sound effects, however, are a completely different fucking case, 
and forgive any unnecessary quote-unquote double standards, as you may be better off looking the other goddamn way thanks to how redundant they'll be after god knows how long, but are still tolerable nonetheless, including but not limited to the minor vocal effects. Before I proceed any further, take note of my top 10 songs displayed here, with several honorable mentions included. Replay value-wise, by now, it should be obvious why this one-of-a-kind action RPG slash environmental simulation hybrid is considered a landmark classic, if much more than that. Despite the plain fact that many mostly prefer the former more than the latter, the simulation phases aren't as cryptic or stagnant as one may speculate or has speculated. In fact, as long as you're eager enough to bridge the gap between these two genres, pun may be intended, while cultivating the Master's overall indefatigable goals, from promising start to the most triumphant and well-deserved resolution, or in layman's terms, end. Considering the tedious and at certain intervals a colossal, cumbersome, ball-busting, shit-spewing, and termite teabagging three-hour length, it's no secret that you'll be descending, hacking and slashing, and virtually sanctifying into the original Actraiser time and again. Therefore, I'd make every effort to experience this unforgettable adventure, regardless of your preferred systemic means. As for its sequel, however... Exhibit B, Act Razor 2. Continuing right from where its predecessor left the fuck off, Tantra's resurrection and rebellion take shape as discovered by the Master, and a long-awaited backstory is introduced. The once-fallen demonic jackass who was once the Master's servant led a strong rebellion against him, but unfortunately lost and was thereby banished from heaven, hence why their rivalry's been brimming for so goddamn long. His slain, deteriorated-as-fuck corpse plunged directly to the underworld. Feeding on the intense, unbreakable hatred each of them held for the Master, Tantra's seven deadly sins and their legion of minions harnessed their power to raise the spirit of their mighty leader. Tantra, now vowing revenge for his defeat by the Master, yet again unleashes those shit-slurping demons upon the world. Now the Master has returned also, this time to once more show Tantra what for, not to mention those fucking so-called minions of his, and restore peace to the world. While it's all the same shit as last time, the environmental sim aspect has been excluded for this often polarized train wreck of a follow-up. Assuming control of the Master yet again, the D-Pad allows him to venture as expected, 
but at a dramatically slower pace than before, while also using it to aim both a sword when striking and his newly equipped shield to deflect any opposing attacks while standing and or crouching still akin to Zelda, X and Y allow the master to perform the customary sword strikes and or perform various magic techniques upon holding either button in conjunction with a D-pad. B and A allow him to jump and glide, with the latter being pulled off after tapping either button twice, but with both an extra maneuver and at a price, respectively. The master can extend his sword below or in front of him should any adversary materialize, but may also end up landing way too far and fast, in which case try slowing him down by the opposite direction of where he's facing, or use up to halt his dive. The different magic incantations that he can summon here include the Earth Force, Fireball, Flame Tongue, Force Bolt, Frost Burst, Lightning Bolt, and the Phoenix, whose symbols are indicated at the top depending on how long you hold down X or Y, with or without the D-pad, or while gliding, all at the cost of a single solitary point of magic, or yet again, MP. In terms of items this time around, the HP and MP or Health and Magic Recovery Orbs are discovered in the Light Orb Towers, which for some reason resemble grave-like monoliths, not to mention are also gained upon eliminating numerous adversaries, but in smaller doses, as are the rare-ass 1-ups. However, the Master can't go above his initial health limit of 20, despite being permitted to gain more magic than what you start off with in each act, specifically either 3 on normal and or hard, or 5 on easy, but only up to and not exceeding 10. As before, should the Master be exposed to any adversary damage, minor or massive, let alone any environmental hazards whatsoever, it's HIS ASS, plain and fucking simple! The new civilizations introduced here are as follows, the Forest of Industin and Diligence, the Rivers of Benefic, Tortoise Island, leading up to Altheria and Devote, Modera outside Zemponia, where the Demon's Cave lies, Deathfield in Justania, followed by Favorian, the Palace in Lovos and the Nightmare Palace, the Prison of Gratis and the Castle of Stormrock in Leon, the Tower of Souls in Hobbleton, and lastly, the Return of Deathheim, with the penultimate serving as the last area in Easy Mode, and the latter serving as such in both Normal and Hard Modes only. Since it's a colossal fucking waste of time classifying every minor creature the Master goes up against, why not the entire boss lineup? Starting with a giant, man-eating Venus flytrap, aka who might like to refer to as another one of Audrey 2's dyslexic step-cousins, and Fatigue, the skeletal, sickle-armed demon that rides atop a possessed vacuum cloud in Dustin, there's also a giant, cobra-like demon in Langor, aka Sloth, not to be confused with that deformed pirate in Goonies, portrayed by the late John Matushak for the record, that stalked the rivers and caves of Benefic, Envy and Jealousy, both a massive, scaly, single-clawed mollusk on Tortoise Island, and the often haunting apparition in Altheria, responsible for possessing the former queen, not to mention sinking both her castle and the earlier explored Tortoise Island, respectively. Both a giant, fire-breathing vulture and the multi-eyed, offspring-producing psychoptic blob Hunger in Modero, the bug-like apparition Gluttony, brooding within the Demon's Cave in Temponia, the Pegasus Knight, followed by yet another disgruntled knight, Anger, aka the possessed King of Justania, in Deathfield, not to mention its surrounding nearby castle, the towering, hell-raising demon Fury, pun barely intended, atop the volcanic terrain of Almiza outside Favorian. Firebrand, meet your new motherfucking roommate! <laughs> the winged half-goat gargoyle werebeast, followed by the frigidly deceptive half-nude vision of beauty, confusion aka lust, at the ice-based palace in Lovos, the purple giant ghost and the horned demon deception in the nightmare palace within the mind of the possessed king of Lovos, the return of that very same werebeast from Lovos, followed by the Goblin King Despair at the prison of Gratis and Leon, the return of both the same giant cobra-like demon from Benefic, plus that jackass werebeast, Honestly, does that bastard even know when to stop? Shit. Followed by the Dragon Demon Doom, not to be confused with id Software's first-person shooter franchise, by the way, aka Greed, at the Castle of Stormrook and Leon, a six-part repeat battle gauntlet of every previous mini-boss leading up to the elemental entity Destruction, aka Pride, at the Tower of Souls in Humbleton, hence yet again the final stage only in easy mode, and lastly at the newly restructured Deathheim, yet another seven-part repeat battle gauntlet of every previous main stage boss leading up to the return and resurrection of that malevolent motherfucker Tantra. If you thought all the horseshit the previous adventure had to offer was beyond demanding and overwhelming, consider these treacherous ass, puke drinking, mucus extracting, blood pissing bastards a well deserved goddamn wake up call! Cause they'll do much worse than rip off your nuts and your kidneys, deep fry them in a volcano, and feed them to the Dark Overlord of the Universe from Howard the Duck, Soren from the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and Pearl from Ty West X and Pearl, without a single solitary semblance of hesitation, remorse, regret, pity, or guilt whatsoever!
All the usual, suspenseful suggestions aside, despite how corrupted, askewed, and randomized the control schematics can be, depending on the master's circumstances, they're at least excusable for the time being, considering the limitations of his basic physical commands, not counting the magic techniques, or using the shield while not moving in or attacking, likewise for the always straightforward and reassuring gameplay procedure. And honestly, I'm totally not bullshitting here. Challenge-wise, in direct comparison to the previous offering, Actraiser 2 is on about the same level, if possibly 10. In fact, you know what? Scratch that. 800,000 notches higher! For starters, remember the Master's dramatically lackadaisical ass pacing I brought up a while ago? Consider that a common pet peeve with this sequel, and one of many reasons why it'll make you its bitch on more occasions than Ladybug, Lemon, Tangerine, The Wolf, The Hornet, and The Prince from Bullet Train combined. Ditto for the fact that every adversary you discover is way more energetic and agile than even the Master himself, leaving his ass open to possible collisions, especially when performing the two gliding maneuvers, both downward and horizontally in a near 90 degree pattern. And don't get me started with a limited magic supply, considering yet again, you can replenish another MP or two even before facing every demon general and or minion, including but not limited to the seven deadly sins, and that you're capable enough of summoning the seven techniques. In other words, should you happen to waste too many, you're better off with your standard sword attacks and physical evasion maneuvers, that is, if you're capable of stomaching the ultimate challenges that call for the latter two approaches more than anything. Either way, and consider this my final reiteration, setting aside the fact that the simulation feature's been permanently fucking nixed here unlike its predecessor, the same suggestions I announced earlier apply here as well. So refer to them whenever necessary, and whatever you do, don't get too immersed in the sights of these all-new areas, as they may serve as unnecessary distractions from your overall commitments. Depending on which difficulty mode you've got set beforehand, you'll start off with either 1, 3, or 5 lives on hard, normal, or easy, respectively. Also, in case you happen to visit a recorder angel on the map, you're provided a 12-digit password in both the US and European versions, with the latter being published by a pre-Rayman Ubisoft for the record, where there's only 21 consonant letters available, uppercase and lowercase, with both an exclamation point and period featured as the only two supporting symbols, and in the Japanese version, where everything's all ditto, except there's all 26 letters, including the fucking vowels. The graphics are beyond stunning, and a substantial step up from its predecessor. Not only does the Mode 7 feature return, especially during the pre-stage descent sequences whenever you access any demon-influenced civilization, but during the opening demos introducing us to these very civilizations. Each and every new domain the Master tirelessly battles his way through is contradictory from one another, putting even Oklahoma, Alabama, Tennessee, Mississippi, South Carolina, Arkansas, and Louisiana, and forgive my wanton insult to the residents of these aforementioned states watching, to absolute irreversible motherfucking contempt, not that I've ever visited any of these states, nor do I hold any desire whatsoever of doing so, but I humbly digress. Running the undeniable gamut from lush forests and swamps, ruined and or partly drowned villages, to volcanic terrains, derelict prisons and dungeons, and even a diverse deluge of palaces, including a near-futuristic variation one might add, not to mention a bizarre macrocosm between reality and the mind of a sleeping character, complete with the richest and attention-worthy textures and detail that almost outshines the previous installment, fuck if not by much. The Master by himself, given both his slightly shorter stature and slower pacing, save for those miraculous, yet at times disadvantageous wings of his, is anything but shabby either. Likewise for the gargantuan, endless assortment of rivals, creatures, and phantoms he encounters every step and or flight of the way. Need the Christ I express more for shit's sake? Music and sound-wise, with Koshiro once again at the helm, each of his offerings new lineup of ambient, orchestral scores don't disappoint either, defying even John Williams, Hans Zimmer, Danny Elfman, Elliot Goldenthal, and even the late Elmer Bernstein, James Horner, and Ennio Morricone, may God rest the souls of the latter three, breathing an unspeakably new life and emotive elements into every in-game aspect like never before, complete with the return of the iconic title theme and the unforgettable descent and stage clear jingles. Granted, many might say otherwise in that they're nothing like what the previous outing had to offer, but just in case anyone's listening or watching, I am, with due generosity, calling instant bullshit on that one. In addition, considering most of the sound effects have been recycled from the previous installment, Cuz Enix, aka Square Enix Now, and Quintet, under no circumstances whatsoever am I bitching about them either. Therefore, WHY THE FUCK START NOW?! Oh, to be fair, take note of my top 8 songs displayed here.
Replay value wise, needless to convey, and as willing as I am to admit, there hasn't been much in the way of any groundbreaking changes here whatsoever. And judging from what we've been witnessing thus far, the reason should be more than obvious. The hero's impartial, albeit apathetic pacing, the somehow welcome, albeit heinously half-assed diving and gliding mechanics when attempting to overcome any common obstacle, regardless of what situation he's in, and considering the fact that this was advertised as a straight, incomparable action title, its level of challenge is nothing more than the result of total, irreversible resentment stemming from those previously indicated gameplay features, thereby time and time again causing you to snap your controller in 10 billion fragments smaller than the testicles of a fucking parasitic wasp. Though, on the same token, an incentive exists where your curiosity for the next area in which to bring about well-deserved order arises depending on your efforts. For the time being, however, once again, no double standards intended. If you happen to fit within the latter category, by all means, give Act Racer 2 a shot, that is, if you're willing to. Otherwise, if you fit within the former category, leave it by the side of the fucking tracks and haul ass as if your natural born life depended on it. Henceforth, what's my final verdict on Act Racer 1 and 2? Words alone can't express the boundless extent of commendation for such a partly overlooked, yet massively celebrated duology, centering around two holy entities working together to, as the first offering's tagline implies, create order from chaos, and the bizarrely materialized impression of why only the sequel was ruled out to be the ideal black sheep out of what we've just observed, notwithstanding the addictive atmospheres they provide, not to mention the boundless religious experiences that put even the Last Crusade to absolute fucking contempt. Either way, all these and more should pretty much epitomize what I've been clarifying, the likes of which, therefore, I advocate referring back to. On the usual scale of 1 to 10, here's how I rate both. With the statistics permanently set in stone, and regardless of what the fuck anyone else believes, I far beyond recommend them. Or just stick with the first, your choice. And if you're able to, be sure to experience and test out ActRaiser Renaissance by Sonic Powered on behalf of Square Enix, a faithful remaster of the original, complete with even more surprises, on Switch, PS4, PC, Android, and iOS. Until then, folks, a belated happy holidays considering they're already over, and a now ensuing kick-ass new year, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro God triumphantly signing off. That's right, let's go! Invade my territory? Fuck no, bro! On guard, motherfucker! Castelia, prick!